if he if he ends up staying with the Nuggets like super long term, we might look back at him as a Rodman type player, a modern Rodman, a modern skilled Rodman that could get points. And welcome back to the Hard to Handle Sports Podcast. My name is Ismael San Juan. Thank you so much for being here. What an emotional weekend of sports. Starting off, Nadal says goodbye to Rome. Was it his goodbye? He did say in his press conference that it's 98% his last time that he plays in Rome. But he leaves the door just slightly open that he might play it next year. What scenes did we see when Nadal exited Rome Court 1 for the last time, potentially? Incredible scenes. Got me emotional. Got all the homies that are Nadal fans emotional. What a sight to see. Djokovic loses to Tabilo. Everyone saw that the water bottle hit him in the top of the head. Did that affect him? He hasn't made a final, I believe, this year. He he hasn't won a title for sure this year. Can he get back into form with Roland Garros around the corner? Also, Real Madrid celebrate their 36 La Liga. They have their little parade in Madrid. Not little, it was big. I saw a hell of people. Mexico also released their Copa America preliminary squad. No Ochoa, no Henry Martin, no Chucky Lozano. No Jimenez. Was this the right decision for Mexico going into the Copa America? The Timberwolves and Nuggets series is now tied 2-2. The champions show their fighting spirit. They tie the series up 2-2. They go into Minnesota, down 0-2. Play two games in Minnesota, and now we're going back to Denver 2-2. Are the Wolves cooked? Did they blow their chance to eliminate the champions? Ant has some words for Murray. Ant is quickly becoming my favorite player in the NBA. All of that on this episode of the Hard to Handle Sports Podcast. Let's get started. Man, oh man, what an emotional weekend in tennis. The Rome Open is going on right now, and it's been pretty sad, not going to lie. Nadal says his goodbye to Rome, potentially. Uh, We'll touch on the possibility of him playing next year at the end but um he loses to her cats he looks outmatched he looks outpowered i saw a comment online that said all the visual stuff of nadal is still there like all his you know um, his grunts are still there um he's still you know doing his routines with his you know pre-serve routine he's still you know warming up the same he's still doing his little hop before the games he's doing uh you know his superstitious stuff with the water bottles everything's there everything just looks like Nadal's there but then when the rally starts when the match gets physical it's not the same Nadal and I mean I gotta admit it's true man it's true like there's some glimpses there's some there's some little rallies where he looks like okay you know this is the Nadal of old or like you know part of him is still there and then there's other times especially against her cast where he just looks like he has no shot to compete against a top 10 player like her cats you know it's just, it's sad but to get Nadal like that is it's definitely emotional now he has been saying that you know he's been kind of holding some stuff back in Barcelona, in Madrid, and that going into Rome, like, this was it. Like, if he had anything to give, he was going to have to leave it all out on in Rome to prepare for Roland Garros, which is kind of sad because, I mean, he didn't, if this was, this was his last warm-up for Roland Garros, and if they, if this was him leaving it all out there to get into rhythm for Roland Garros, then, you know, It's going to be a rough showing at Roland Garros. And he's saying that he's still deciding if he's going to play. I believe he is going to play. There's just no way that he skips Roland Garros on his farewell tour. And like this is shaping out to be, you know, Roland Garros is synonymous with Rafael Nadal. So I do believe he's going to play. Is there any chance that Nadal wins Roland Garros? I mean... If we're talking about miracles, you know, the miracles in Mel- the miracle in Melbourne coming down from 0-2 sets against 
Medvedev, who had just, you know, freaking beaten Djokovic at the US Open, who's a hardcore specialist, Nadal, who had been coming back from an injury. For him to do that, that was one of the miracles in tennis. So if he's able to replicate something similar two years after in Roland Garros, it would be insane. Is it likely? Hell no. I mean, from what I've seen in the lead up in Barcelona, in Madrid, in Rome, it's it's looking bleak. And I mean, no one wants to count out in a dog because it's, you know, he basically built Roland Garros. He has a statue there already as a player to have a statue at a Grand Slam while you're still playing is insane. But I give it a less less than 15% chance that he wins Roland Garros. And 14%, 13% of the chance I give him is, or maybe all 14, all 14% of the chance I give him is the 14 titles that he has there. Maybe like... Maybe less than 20. Because there's been like tiny glimpses in this lead up. So I'll give him a percent for every Grand Slam that he has. So he has 14% chance. And then I'll give him maybe like 2 or 3% for what I've seen. Coming like from, from what I've seen him in, in the lead up to Roland Garros. And then I'll give him another 2%. Because the field is hurt and because Djokovic might have a concussion that we'll talk about in just in a little bit. So, you know, he actually I'm actually giving him a lot of chances. Now, if you go into any Grand Slam and you have like a 20 percent chance of winning, that's actually pretty good against the field. But like that's probably what if we're being serious. The the only reason Nadal has a slight chance of winning Roland Garros, even though most people would say no and that he's going to get squashed in the first or second round, it's going to be kind of sad and there'll be a whole ceremony, is that you can never count out that all these tennis players are human. And playing Nadal in Roland Garros in center court, that in of itself, it's a whole monster that you got to fight against. Yeah, playing against him in Rome and Madrid and Barcelona could feel similar. But he has 10 titles in Rome. He has, I think, four in Madrid. I don't know how many he has in Barcelona. Probably around eight or 10. But 14 Grand Slams and to see a statue as, you know, you're making you commute into the French Open. That in of itself is a whole monster. That 97% win percentage that he has there is a whole thing. Like these tennis players are human. And this younger generation, this next gen, this next, next gen, they have shown that, you know, they're not mentally there yet. Next gen, the ship has kind of sailed. TC Paz, Zverev, you know, they're mentally they're not there. This next, next gen, they're still green. They're not ripe yet. So, I could see that playing a factor. I could see, you know, the magnitude of the moment playing the king of clay in a five set gruesome match. It it could it could lean towards Nadal. And the crowd is just going to be if if it's already 100% Nadal when he plays in Roland Garros, it's going to be 1000% Nadal. So because of that, I give him a slight chance of winning Roland Garros. I I I never want to count him out. If, if he's able to take a whole year off and win Australian Open with very little warm-up, I mean, he I think he did win a title, a 250, leading up to Australian Open, so this is different. But he had never won the Australian – he had only won the Australian Open once before that title. So it's it's not like a historic – like he's not used to winning that. He's not a favorite of winning the Australian Open by any chance. So if he's able to win the Australian Open – Obviously, there was no Djokovic in that field, but we'll talk about Djokovic. He's not at his best right now. I think Nadal could do, could do the impossible. Could could just shock us for one last time. Could just give us another glimpse of what his career has been. Injuries, a lot of what ifs, a lot of man. If this guy was just healthy consistently, what could he have done? 
but a warrior. A warrior, someone that never gave up. And I think he has the possibility to shock the world one last time and, you know, just go off into the sunset. I feel like if he wins Roland Garros, he calls it right there. But he's competitive, actually. I don't know. He might keep playing. But I think he can shock the world one last time. But from what I've seen these last few games, yeah, he's, he's pretty much cooked. But there's a part of me. When we look at life, we think about it like this stuff only happens in the movies. This is this is real life. This doesn't happen. But time and time again, sports is like movies. The unpredictable, the crazy things happen. The things that you're like, wow, this should only be happening in a movie script. Leicester winning the Premier League. Greece winning the Euros. You know, other unfathomable things that have happened in sports happen. So this is the perfect storm. This is the perfect, you know, script for Nadal to just give us another magical moment. And obviously, as a Nadal fan, I'm pretty much rooting for that, hoping for that. And I'll be watching. But back to Rome, what an incredible scene that was like. Man, are we ever going to have a player as big as Nadal? Like, ever? Probably not. Like, the scenes that were that the Italians and any tennis, fan, tennis fans that showed up to the Rome Open, the Italian Open, it was just magnificent. It was the whole country of Italy and anyone that showed up just showing their respects to Nadal and giving him a beautiful moment. On TV, it was beautiful. I can't even imagine how it felt being there. And we're truly, you know, we're truly on the last few pages of this beautiful book of Nadal's career. And we better enjoy it. I, I know I'm, I've am i been enjoying it. Uh, you know, it's, as being a tennis fan in the U.S., these matches are a little early. They're, they're not in the best times, but it's Nadal's last few games, his last few matches, it feels like, so... You know, I've been doing my best to try to, to catch a game. But, woo, man, those scenes are incredible. I'll try to put some pictures on the YouTube video. If you're listening on the podcast, make sure just, if you haven't seen it, just Google it, Nadal Rome. I'm sure it'll be the first thing that shows up. It was just scenes, man, scenes. They were like, is this Argentina celebrating the World Cup or is this Nadal? Like, you can't tell the difference. There's so many people. It was incredible. It was incredible. Um... Especially because I've gone to some tennis tournament. It's not like it's not like anyone in the public could just show up. You gotta get like at least a grounds pass to enter the the campus, you know. So it's not like the the capacity is capped out, you know, because you you gotta have a ticket to enter the the venue or like the grounds. So it seemed like everybody that was at the grounds was there. Like I don't know who the hell was playing at that time in the other courts. However many courts they have, they probably have around 10 courts. I'm pretty sure all 10 courts were empty. And everyone that had a grounds pass, everyone that had a, tickets to Stadium 1 and Stadium 2, Stadium 3, everybody was there. So it's just uh, that the allure that Nadal has is incredible. And I've been rambling for a minute, but man, shout out Nadal, tennis idol, tennis icon. Uh, I hope he wins Roland Garros. But he did say 98% chance in his press conference, which means there's a 2% chance he plays next year, which means that, you know, his competitive juices are still flowing. And I'm pretty sure in the back of his head, he's like, man, I hope this is not my last time. I hope I hope my body gives me maybe another year of just, you know, a spotty schedule. Maybe this is his last year trying to do the full schedule. Maybe he's able to just pick and choose a couple of tournaments, a couple of Masters 1000s to play every year. Maybe play Roland Garros for the next two years and don't play any of the other slams. Something like that. Keep a light schedule. Do a Nick Kyrgios. If Nick Kyrgios could skip the clay season every year, why can't Nadal just skip, um, you know, three, the hard court and the grass swing every year and just play the clay? Why not? Why not? But changing topics... Djokovic gets absolutely cooked by Tabilo. And this is probably the worst that a lot of people have seen Djokovic play. It was it was something to see. Like it looked like he could not hit 
three, four balls back at Tavilo. Like if the rally went any longer than three shots, three, four shots, it was over. He was not able to to get anything going. I believe I saw somewhere online that Djokovic lost in less time to Tavilo than Nadal did to her cats. So my boy got dog walked out of there. Djokovic got cooked. And it's easy to say that this is just not Djokovic's year. He has made zero finals. He has zero titles this year. And it, it, it's kind of looking like Father Time is catching up to him. It's kind of looking like he's not as twitchy. He's not as elastic as he used to be. His defense is not, you know, the all-time elite that it has been. But we can't ignore the accident that happened just a couple of days ago where, you know, this fan was going for a high five. He reaches over the the barricade above Djokovic and the water bottle falls off of his backpack hits Djokovic in the head. Djokovic falls to his knees, and then they take him in. I mean, I don't know if you have those water bottles. It looked like it was one of those, you know, water bottles that keep keep your water, you know, hydro flask, um, Yeti, whatever. All, one of those brands where it just keeps your water insulated for like a good a good amount of time. And those those are hard. Those are hard. If you guys don't have one, which I'm pretty sure. Everyone has had one for the most part, you know, a Stanley, Hydro Flask, whatever it is. Those are hard. Like you could really smack someone with it and like really hurt them. Sometimes I'm walking at night in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco. You never know what you can run into. And I got my water bottle on me and I'm, I'm wielding it, you know, ready to smack someone. So th- those could hurt. Now, they could hurt just empty. But if if they're filled with water, man, you could really you could really pop someone. So for it to fall on him from probably like 10, 15 feet, I want to say, it, it could be it could do some damage. It could definitely do some damage. Hopefully for Djokovic, you know, it was that fan was probably, you know, in the Italy heat. Hopefully for Djokovic, he drank most of the water in that water bottle and it wasn't as heavy as it could have been. But still, that could definitely do some damage. Djokovic could have definitely been experiencing a concussion after that. And if he was, then, you know, your balance and everything could be, you know, out of sort. And tennis is a very, is a sport that heavily relies on balance and being able to, you know, control how you shift your body as you're approaching balls and all that stuff. So I could definitely see that playing a factor today or playing a factor on Djokovic's match against Tabilo. And maybe he should have dropped out of Rome. I mean, people were calling him a diva and saying that he was exaggerating that. But, I mean, head injuries are no joke. Just ask the NFL. Like, they take it super seriously. They're not trying to get sued by anything, by anyone. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. So if Djokovic was experiencing concussion-like symptoms, playing a grueling match in the Italian heat. Could have definitely made it worse, and he could have been super out of sorts out there. Credit to him for finishing. So I think that's a real possibility that he was experiencing concussion-like symptoms, and he dug it out. He, you know, he tried to compete, and he was just not feeling himself. I'll give that probably like a 75% chance of what happened. Combined with, you know, the other 25% that Djokovic just hasn't looked like, you know, the tennis god that he is this year. And that's, he's 36 years old, and that's that's okay. But I think to count Djokovic out for Roland Garros, to count him out, you know, for the rest of the year, saying that, you know, he's kind of washed, he hasn't won a title, he, he's looking a little slower, he's not the same, I think that's a little premature. Now... Roland Garros, we'll see how he recovers from his head injury if he is experiencing concussion. Um, I don't expect him to win Roland Garros, especially after what we've seen from him against Tabilo. But if he struggles in Wimbledon and then he struggles in the U.S. Open, then we might be seeing, you know, a little bit of the downfall of Djokovic. And I don't think... 
I don't think it's it's a cliff. I don't think it's a cliff. I think I mean downfall of Djokovic. He's still the number one ranked player. He could lose that at Roland Garros if he doesn't get to the final, I believe. But I think it'll be a slow decline. I think against the field, like he'll probably be, if if this is a decline, I still have him like number three. Sinner and Djokovic. I mean Sinner and Akras battling it out for number one and then Djokovic. At this decline, I still have him right there at that Medvedev level, maybe even above him from what I've seen. And then I think in the next few years, he'll probably be top five, top seven. If this is a decline, if it's not just like a little slump that he's going through. And then, you know, I still think we have Djokovic for like two, three years being a top 10 player. If this is a decline, like I said, it could be it could just be a little slump that he's in, you know, start the year slow. Like we, this could all be a mute point. I don't think he wins Roland Garros, but this could this could all be a mute point if, at the end of the year, he's ranked number one. He won Wimbledon. He won the U.S. Open. He's going into the finals, into the ATP finals with two slams in a, in the year. It would be like I remember when, remember when it was uh, mid May and he still hadn't won a title, and would be like, ha, huh, people thought he was done. So uh, like I like I said, this could all just be a little slump. I don't think he's going to win Roland Garros, but like I said, the same reason I have with Nadal, the field is injured. Sinner and Alcaraz are hurt. And, I mean, I, I always give Djokovic definitely a chance to win Roland Garros. I don't think he will, but I, I could see him winning it. I, I wouldn't count him out is what I'm trying to say. Real Madrid celebrate their 36th La Liga in Madrid in front of their fans. And, man, not too many takeaways from it other than what a beautiful sight it was. Que bonito es ser madrista. How nice it is to be a madrista. Like, how nice is it is to have Ancelotti. How nice it is to have Rodrigo and Vinicius and Bellingham, Belligol. How nice it is to see a squad of players just enjoy each other's company. And... I must comment on Bellingham's Spanish. It's grown a lot since the beginning of the season. What a smart fella. Learning a new language is not easy. I, I know there's a lot of people out there doing Duolingo, doing Rosetta Stone, doing Inglés Sin Barreras, if that's still a thing. It's not easy to learn a new language. And the improvement of Bellingham from the beginning of the season to right now in his Spanish is, you know, it's another indicator of how much how smart he is and how much time he puts into getting better. And that's that's uh, that's beautiful because if he's putting that much time to learn Spanish and you can see it with the way he talks, he he talks good Spanish. He low-key has better Spanish than Vinicius. Then it gives me all the more reason to believe he's just going to keep getting better and better as a player, as a soccer player, because we could tell that football, football is his love. So if he's putting effort to learn Spanish, I can only imagine the effort he puts on the field to get better and better every day at football. So I just want to put that point that out. Congratulations to Real Madrid and all the fans, man. It's this is not just for for the team, but for us. Like they do it, Hala Madrid, así así, así gana el Madrid. You know all that stuff, Madrid, Madrid, y nada más, y nada más. You know how it be. It's beautiful to be a Madrista. And now we might get a little unfair with Mbappe saying goodbye to PSG, having his whole, you know, press release and all that stuff. Um, it's it's inevitable. He's going to sign with us. It's finally going to happen after, you know, teasing us and toying with us in 2022. It's finally going to happen in 2024. It looks like Mbappe to Madrid is all but a done deal. I mean, anything can happen, but it looks like it's it's done. Mbappe is going to be a Madrista. And man, oh man. Cross-sport reference. This kind of feels like KD when he signed with the with with the Warriors in 20, what was it, 2015? And they went on to win two championships in three years. It's it's kind of scary. It's kind of scary what Real Madrid could look like with Mbappe. Now I hope. He brings a good attitude, and I hope he doesn't, you know, mess up the locker room because I think anyone that looks in 
from the outside could tell you that this Real Madrid team has excellent vibes. Like the vibes are whoopty. The vibes are whoopty. The vibes are immaculate. Everyone is just amigos with everyone. Aquí con los amigos. Everyone's just super homie with each other. Like, don't want to psychoanalyze that locker room, but man, it just looks like those vibes are just whoopty as hell, man. Like, it's just beautiful. Everyone gets along with each other. The fans love the players. The players love the fans. Like, I think the team chemistry is like A+. Plus. And the talent is already like an A. The coaching is an A. We're adding an A plus player to this A squad. Like it's just it, it could be it could be scary for Europe and La Liga and anybody else. Like it could be it could be bad. So Mbappe seems to be all but confirmed to Real Madrid. I just hope he doesn't miss I, that's the only thing that could go bad. He ruins the locker room. But football wise I mean, I think Vini and him would switch off the left side. Rodrigo could play the nine. He's a versatile player. And they'll just make it happen. I have full trust in Ancelotti, kind of like I had in Sidan, like that he'll get the personalities right. And he's cool as ever. And the flow of the year, Real Madrid being in so many competitions, uh, naturally there will be injuries. Um, and, and it'll help rotate players. Players will get starting positions because players naturally will get injured. It's just a thing with modern soccer and so many games. Players will get injured, unfortunately. Hopefully no serious ones. But, man, that squad is going to be stacked for next year if we get Mbappe. Even if we don't, it already is stacked. But it's scary hours for the rest of the world right now, man. Scary hours. Hala Madrid. But it could be scary hours for us Mexican fans. Going into the Copa America, this Mexico squad does not look amazing. This Mexico squad has not given Mexico fans any confidence, any, you know, sort of hope going into the Copa America. But the preliminary squad just came out for the Copa America for Mexico. And a lot of people were hoping for this. And it finally happened. No Ochoa, no Henry Martin, no Raul Jimenez. No Chucky Lozano. Whoo, man. Man, oh, man. Was this the right decision? Was this the right thing to do? I think people are super happy because it's a turn of the page. You know, people were asking for that. They need to let the young players play. They need to give players a chance to shine, to become the new stars of Mexico. And I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I think this change is kind of being overhyped a little bit. Because, all right, Raul Jimenez isn't getting called up. He hasn't been called up in, like, the last two or three, I believe. He's not getting minutes for Hope for him. We all understand he's not the same player. Yeah, he probably shouldn't have gone to the World Cup, but calling it a generational change because he's not here in this squad, I mean, he hasn't been in the last few. So, okay. Can't really get too much credit for calling it a generational change with Raul Jimenez not being there since he hasn't been there in the last two call-ups. All right. The other one, Ochoa. Well, he's not really the starter for uh, the Italian team anymore, Sala Martina, whatever whatever the name is. Um, so, you know, that one's understood. He's looking for a new club. And, you know, Malagón does deserve a chance to be the number one. So, you know, props props to that one. I think that one that one's probably the one that's getting people the most attention, the most, uh, you know, cause for celebration. I like that one. I'm an America fan, so Malagón's our keeper. Happy to see him get that number one spot for the national team. Ochoa is one of, you know, ours too from America. So a little sad. Not not too sad. I hope he finds the team. It's rumored that he might end up with San Diego FC. I'm from San Diego, so I'm happy about that. Hopefully he finds a good team. Is this the last we're gonna see of Ochoa in the selección? I don't think so. I think I think it's part of part of I think him not being in the squad is mostly for two reasons. Give Malagón a chance to be the starter in a big tournament like the Copa America. And the second reason is that Ochoa needs to find a team. So he's probably going to spend summer, you know, flirting with teams, taking interviews, seeing seeing what's a good fit for him at this stage of his career. So that's a good one. Leaving Ochoa, that's a good one. Henry Martin, I think, is actually the biggest one. The biggest reason Mexico fans should be happy for 
because although I do like Henry Martin and he plays for America and I think he'll be a good sub, for some reason Lozano te- seemed to think that he was starter material and he like fell in love with him and he just couldn't stop starting Henry Martin. And I, I don't understand the reasoning when you have something Jimenez and the ideal scenario for me is to carry both of them and use Santi Jimenez as your starter because he's clearly the most talented striker that we have. And But Henry Martin, in my opinion, does deserve at least a squad, a, a roster spot on the on the squad. Like, he at least deserves to be called up, in my opinion. But for some, re- for some reason, Lozano can't call him up and leave him in the bench as a sub or, like, as a, you know, last minute, we need to get a goal, some big man, because he could, you know, he's good as a aerial threat. If you just want to launch balls into the box, like that would be the ideal way to use him. Santi starts is your one of your star players, and you bring him handling as as a sub, as someone that could help, you know, maybe if chase a score if you're down. But for some reason, he can't do that. He can't do that. So if we know Lozano can't do that, he can't help himself to call Henry and not start him. Then I think leaving him out is is a good call because for some reason he can't call him up and not start him. And I think the main priority for this team is to get Santi Jimenez going. He's our youngest star. Other than um, Edson Alvarez, he, he's the best attacking prospect we've had probably since Borghetti. And it wouldn't, I don't think it would be crazy to say since Hugo, with, after Vela you know, had no desire to really play for Mexico. Since Vela had no desire to play for Mexico and Gio was more of a winger, I think that's the main priority for Mexico to really cultivate Santi Jimenez talent. So if Lozano can't bring Henry as a bench, as a revulsivo, as someone you bring in to chase a score, if he always has to start Henry for some reason, then I like that. Keep him out. Now you're forced to play Santi. And if he doesn't play Santi, if you play someone else, then this man is, this man needs to be drug tested and, the Copa America should be his last tournament at the helm. Like if you if you leave Henry Martin off the squad and you still don't start Santi, yeah, bro, you're out of here. You're out of here. So that's a good one. Chucky Lozano. That one, I mean, I don't know why people are calling for Chucky. Yeah, he's been a disappointment with the selection. But like, it's a little harsh. Not gonna lie, it's a little harsh. He's 28 years old. He plays for PSV. Um so he's still in Europe. He's had a decent season with them, but there's not too many players playing in Europe. He's still fast. He could still like offer something. I don't think he deserves to not be part of the squad. Um, so that one, that one. I mean, people are kind of celebrating it. I, I mean, I criticize. I'm one of Chucky Lozano's um, critics. Like I will say that for the talent and promise that he showed, especially after the goal against Germany. He should have done more with the Selección and he just hasn't really produced the goals or the assist that, you know, someone of his caliber and his potential at the time warranted. But to not get caught up is a little harsh. So in my opinion, Jimenez not getting caught up doesn't really bring happiness or sadness to me. Like, I wouldn't call that. He's already not been in the, in the last few squads. So that... That doesn't signify a change. Like that's just it's natural. Like he should have he's he's kind of washed. He's done. That 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 shouldn't be news, is what I'm trying to say. He's washed. Like let him fade into the sunset. Ochoa makes sense. Give Malagon a chance. Let Ochoa find a team. We'll see how Malagon does. I doubt we've seen the last of Ochoa with the national team, but this is a good stepping stone and maybe when he comes back. Malagón had a good Copa America. He's our starter. Ochoa, if you want to be part of the squad, now you're you're the second one. And I think obviously he's gonna be upset, but I think he'll accept that if he if he wants to go to another World Cup. And you know, what would it be his sixth one? And I think he'll be probably the first one to do that, or maybe second to do that. Then he could go as a sub. Um, Henry Martin, I think he deserves a chance to be in the squad. I mean, Mexico doesn't ha- isn't like super blessed with strikers, but like I said, Lozano doesn't can't bring him on the team and not start him. So it's good for Santi 
And then Chucky Lozano. That one, I mean, if he's looking for a new team, it might be helpful. But I think ultimately he'll be 30 years old. I think by the next World Cup, I think I think he'll be there, to be honest. I think he'll be there at 30 years old. He'll still be good enough. I think he's good enough right now to be in the team. So the only ones that really make sense is Ochoa and Henry Martin that we should be excited about. But it's good. Malagón deserves his spot, and Santi Jiménez is our best prospect. So those are the two that should be garnering the headlines. Henry and Ochoa. And Henry should be there to be, like, I keep harping on this. Henry should be there, and Lozano should have, you know, the, the intelligence to take him as a backup striker. But he can't, so we'll see. But that's my takes. There, I mean, I've been all over the place, but... I think this is being overhyped a little bit as a generational change. I think the main one is Ochoa and Henry Martin. I think Chucky Lozano is still going to be part of the squad. They want to let other wingers get their shine. We'll see what, what they do. But overall, I think I think it's the right decision. Chucky could have helped, could have helped in the Copa America, even though he's been disappointed with the selection. And Santi, but Santi Jimenez getting the start. And developing is the number one priority. So I like this move. I like it. Let me know what you guys think. I know I've been rambling, but let me know what you guys think. Are the Timberwolves cooked? After taking a 2-0 lead against the champions in Denver, they lose the next two games in Minnesota. Oh, my God. I was one of those people. I was like, the Nuggets are cooked. They're cooked. Timberwolves in five after the first two games. And now it's a series it's basically 0-0, zero, zero, three games left, best of three zero, series, best of three series, and man, what's going to happen? It looks like the Nuggets figured something out, and it wasn't that hard. I think I think what they figured out is that Jamal Murray needs to get healthy. They had three days off, and he was able to get noticeably healthier, and just give the ball to Jokic. It's not that hard. He'll find the player. They'll press up on him, and he'll be able to dump it off to a lot of players. Aaron Gordon is, like, the most elite role player in the league right now. He knows his role. He's fine being the fourth fiddle. His defense intensity has completely risen to, like, amazing levels since being with the Magic. He's a hustle player now. He's a rebound player. He 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 runs up and down the court. He's just an engine He's an engine that could fade away and give you a bucket. He's an engine that could go get a rebound and do a putback. He's just a very smart player. How good is Aaron Gordon? I don't know, man. Like, when he was with the Magic and he was winning dunk and he should have won the dunk contest, I was like, this guy has potential to be, you know, the maybe not the number one, but a high number two, like a not, not skill-wise not not in their game but like an impact on the team i i gave him the ceiling coming out of in, when he was with the magic and he was developing as a player i could be i was thinking of him as a paul george impact level player as his peak like that was his potential to be the number two on a team and i'm not comparing games don't don't misquote me and say i'm comparing like oh paul george and aaron gordon's game are not even close like Paul George is way silkier. He got a way better handle. All He got a way better three. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that was his potential and not game style. I'm talking about impact on a game. I was thinking his potential for Aaron Gordon is to be a really good number two. That kind of, that could be a pseudo one, you know? Like if he's the number one on your team, you could make the playoffs, but you can't really win a championship. If he's the number two on your team, he could be... Um, you could be a really good team, but he never reached that. He never reached that potential. Like no one would look at Aaron Gordon, even now that he's gotten better, and say he could be the number two on your team. But he could be the damn best number four in the league, and he could be a really, really good number three. And he just knows his role, man. And he's like a if he if he ends up staying with the Nuggets like super long term, we might look back at him as a rodman type player a modern rodman a modern skilled rodman that could get points and that's high praise but like 
when he's on, when his and he, his motor is super high, to be honest. I'm super impressed with the way he gets rebounds and how good he, he tries on defense. He is an elite role player, man. He is an elite role player. He had 27 today. He's one of the main reasons they won. Jokic is a savant with the ball. He's able to find these passes. And to have a player like Aaron Gordon at that size, he's like, what, 6'10". He rebounds like crazy. When all, all, all when everything fails, he's 6'10". And when the play just goes to shit, when, it, when nothing's going on, if he's left with the ball on his hands with like five seconds left, it's not the end of the world. He'll go into a post-up. He'll fade away. Obviously, it's a contested shot. It's not the best shot to get, but it's, you're not like, damn, we have a terrible player taking the shot. It's a decent shot. And that's all you could ask for from your number four. And to get, for him to give you 27 points, that's that's amazing. So shout out to Aaron Gordon for really improving, being an amazing, amazing role player, and being someone that just contributes night in and night out. What was that saying they say? Not everyone could be a star, but you could be a star in your role. That's Aaron Gordon. Props to him. And Ant scored, what, like 44 points. He was going back and forth with Jamal Murray. Ant might be my best, my favorite player, man. He is a dog. The way he answers the press conference is hilarious. Man, I told his ass that I love this shit. <laughs> what a guy. Ant is a dog. I love how he plays. I love how he carries himself. He's a G, man. He's he's a dog. I don't think the series is over. To answer the questions, are the Timberwolves cooked? No. I think they have a chance. I think they got a little I think they got a little ahead of themselves. Not Ant necessarily, but the the role players. Um I think Cat has been playing super soft these last few games. I think he needs to step it up. He needs to, he you need to get 25 from Cat for you guys to have a chance. If he's going 12, 15, no shot. Cat needs to find his rhythm, find his shot, and really give Ant, you know, that second, that Robin that he needs. Not gonna lie, the best the Timberwolves looked this series was when Rudy was out because of his kid. So if I'm if I'm the Minnesota coach, coaching staff, although it sucks for Rudy and he just won another defensive player of the year um this has been a topic that was discussed when rudy was with the utah jazz like you could really be the defensive player of the year and be a defensive liability in the in the playoffs and you couldn't really tell in the first round and they won game one with rudy on the court and he played pretty good but the best game that the wolves have looked against the nuggets has been game two when rudy was you know, celebrating with his wife the birth of their kid, you know, congratulations and everything. But if I'm the Wolves coach, coaching staff, I'm pulling Rudy pretty quick from game five if we're down. I think that's a that's some of the hard decisions you got to make in the playoffs, especially in a tight series like these 2-2. You lost momentum. You need to do something to give your team hope. And you got to take the bull by the horn sometimes. So if it's game five and you're down 10, you're down 15, kind of like at this in this uh, in this game, I think in the second half, you just talk to in the halftime, you talk to Rudy and you're like, you know what? We're going to have to sit you or we're going to we're going to play you like 10 minutes the second half. Like we just got to try something. We got to try something else. We got the six men of the year who was playing great, who played great in your absence and Rudy just got to understand and you know next man up but this game was this game was very good very interesting this game was i think one the last half the last few minutes of the of the half i love Ant, but he needs to run that clock out he needs to run that clock out i know you might be enticed to go get a bucket before even the the greats have laps of judgment like LeBron James, when was it? Game two when Jamal Murray hit the game winner in us and uh, LeBron kind of got away with the push off and there was like 13 seconds left and we could have run it down. But since he was so wide open, he took a shot. I think Ant just, 
was in a similar position. He probably had a good matchup. He thought he could fl- he could uh, fly by him, and he lost his handle. Timberwolves go and score two. Then an errant pass to Ant gets intercepted by Jamal Murray, launches a half-court shot, three-point is made. You Now, instead of being down 10, you're down 15. You give up five points in the last 10 seconds, and you're demoralized, and you never cut the lead. I think seven was the closest they got, so... It would have been two points if those five points weren't there. You know what I mean? It would have been a super close game. But it is what it is. I think the Wolves are definitely wounded, and it looks like they might be cooked. But they're not They're not done yet. And I, I would say right now I'm feeling, just because I love Ant that much, and they still have that lineup that they could go to, benching Rudy, Wolves in seven. But that should do it for this episode of the Hearts Handle Sports Podcast. As always, if you made it to the end, I appreciate you. If you didn't, you know, just come back and finish it whenever you get a chance. I hope everyone has a great day. Peace.